All right, so so first question is what is this investigation? It's a press tomography. The second one is to, to talk about the anatomy of the press, the parenchyma. And the parenchyma is divided into basically three components, the stroma and the lobules and the ducts as well. So these are the three components of the breast uh, parenchyma. All right. So the next bit is um, what are the lymphatic drainage of the breast? Uh, I can't see anything in the screen. That's fine. You don't have to see. <laughs> Just uh, okay. yeah. What are the lymphatic drainage of the screen of the the breast? I'm gonna uh, the yeah, axillary lymph nodes. Yeah. And the uh, pectoral lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do anything else? Uh, the so the fatty range of the breast is, yeah, like you said, is axillary uh, lymph nodes uh, and also um, the internal mammary lymph nodes and supraclavicular uh, lymph nodes, so, right? These are generally um, the lymphatic drainage of the breast. The axillary lymph nodes are basically five groups. And these five groups are anterior, posterior, and lateral, and medial, and apical as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, so these are the lymphatic drainage of, uh, of the press. It's all these groups of lymph nodes. Okay. okay. All right. What is the blood supply of the press? Uh, the internal memory artery. Where does it come from? Internal. So right, so so internal memory artery. It's a, it's a branch from the subclavian and also the uh, laterally from branches from the lateral thoracic artery, and you have uh, deeply through so some perforators uh, in pectoral is major muscle, which is formed from the thoracoacromial trunk and inferior and laterally from branches of the intercostal artery. So if you think about the shape of the breast, all right, so it's a round in shape. So internal memory artery is very close to the the uh, uh, sternum, just behind the sternum, it's called the internal thoracic artery. So, I mean, obviously one artery will not be able to provide all the, that big uh, size depressed, right? So you have from the medial side, you have internal memory artery. From the lateral side, you have the lateral thoracic artery, all right? Uh, you have the thoracoacromial trunk, which is coming from the axillary, uh, and also the intercostal arteries as well from the peripheries, okay? Okay. So the breast is considered as a modified type uh, of which kind of a skin gland? So it's a, we always say that the breast is a modified sweat gland, but what kind of sweat gland it is? Do you no. know, the, I think it's a difficult question. So it's called apocrine sweat gland. So it's a modified apocrine sweat gland. So when you look at the histological structure of a sweat gland, it will be very similar to the breast. Okay. So let's move on. Is there any, if you if you look at these these titles, is there anyone that you feel comfortable with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the breast only that uh, I'm not comfortable with, but okay. uh, I That's think fine. the brachial plexus. Yeah. yeah, okay, so can you mention the brachial plexus surface anatomy, parts and location, or parts location? Uh, yeah, the uh, there is uh, uh, the trunks, cords, divisions. The brachial plexus consists of the uh, the roots and the trunks and the vision and the cords, uh, which is uh, the roots which is exit from the intervertebral foramina between the anterior medius and anterior uh, scalenus anterior scalenus medius, and uh, the trunk which is found at the base of the posterior triangle behind the third part of the subclavian artery, uh, also the divisions behind the middle third of the clavicle, and the uh, cords which is related to the second part of the axillary artery. Okay, so you, initially the surface anatomy is two inch. That's the surface anatomy questions two inch from the sternoclavicular joint between the scalenus anterior and the scalenus medius. That's how you how you found this the precaplexus by surface anatomy. The parts, like you said, you do have the roots, uh, and the roots is between the scalenus anterior and medius, and the trunks and between in the posterior triangle, third part of subclavian divisions, uh, middle third of the clavicle, and cords. Uh, second actually part. Can you talk talk me through herbs palsy? What will be the clinical finding in herbs palsy? Uh, first herbs palsy it is due to the damage of uh, damage root C5 and C6, 
uh, and uh, there is a motor and sensory affection. The sensory, it will be the loss of the sensation of the radial side of the arm and the forearm, while the motor affection, uh, it leads to what's called wetter tip deformity, which includes uh, paralysis of the in uh, arm abductors, uh, which leads to arm abductions and the paralysis of the external arm rotators and paralysis uh, of the forearm flexors and supinators and the paralysis of the external carpiradialis lungs. Yeah, uh, what about sensory? A sensory to the lost sensation of the radial side of the arm and the forearm. I, I, I said first. Yeah, sorry about that. Maybe I didn't notice it. So C5 and C6, that's right. And you divide it. I mean, just make your answer, Nazir. I mean, you, you, you know very well the answer and they've answered it very well, but I would advise just make it very short to the examiner. So yeah. C5 and C6, and it is sensory and motor. The sensory is the radial side of the arm and forearm, and the motor, it's um, uh, obviously it's all these details, but what I'm gonna advise is the, uh, just mention what happens, what can you find in your examination? So the arm is abducted, internally rotated, the elbow is extended, and the rest is slightly flexed, with some sort of anal deviation. That's what I'm going to say. And if the examiner asks me further question, well, we can start by talking about the muscles that are paralyzed, as you can see in here. So just make your answer very short, um, because, you know, the uh, I think, I mean, obviously I haven't taken the exam before, so I think uh, from what I hear from different people and so on on, on the reading the books, there is mainly very quick question. They need quick answer from you, all right? Yeah. OK, so Coulomb's paralysis. Um, uh, can this? Yeah, it will be uh, the injury to the lower roots C8 and T1, and also to include a motor affection and sensory infection. First sensory, it will be loss of sensation over the under border of the arm, uh, uh, the hand and forearm, while the motor, it will form the claw hand deformity, which will be paralysis of the all entrancing hand muscles, muscle wastings and will be paralysis of the wrist and the f uh, finger flexors. And uh, there will be hyperextension of the metacarpopharyngeal joints and flexion of the proximal interpharyngeal joints. OK, excellent. This is so much better. The, this is what I'm talking about. So very, very systematic and organized this one. Well done. All right, so in terms of histology, we're going to talk a little bit about histology. So I'd like you to identify number three, six and eight uh, in this diagram. What is three? Uh, three, it will be the greater tubercle. Okay, what about six? Six, eight, a tubercle uh, What about eight? A lizard tubercle. Okay, can you tell me the muscles attached to number three? Uh, muscle attached to number three, it will be the greater tubercle. Uh, it will be biceps muscle. No, biceps is not attached to biceps. Biceps. No, I don't know. It's right. Can you tell me the muscles pass through number three, number six? There's a muscle uh, that passes through. Problem with the muscles attachment on the bones. Okay, that's uh, fine. Do you remember number eight? No, not also. I'll ask you a different question. Do you remember the rotator cuff muscles? Yeah, yeah, I forget. Yeah, I remember now. Uh, the greater, uh, so that the greater tubercle, it will be the uh, set supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the teres minor. While uh, the uh, lesser tubercle, it will be the subscapularis muscle. Okay, that is uh, pretty good. So in terms of the, um, I mean, I'm sorry about the, the numbers will be changed. I need to bring it to the non-reading view, but that's fine. So let's just continue now and we're going to come back to the answers. What about the number six? Do you know there is a tendon that passes in between? Uh, the, uh... It's the long head of biceps that passes in this area. All right. Long of biceps, okay. And there is a muscle attached to it. Do you know that that mnemonic that is called a lady between two measures? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lady. Latissimus dorsi. Yeah. So Latissimus the... dorsi will be at, attached to to this uh, in between the basilar groove, and you have the longer of biceps passing here, 
and you know number three is the set, and this is the S part of the uh, rotator cuff muscles. All right. So what about number five? What is five? Five this will be the head of the of the humerus. Yeah. So if you remember from last time, we need to be very specific. So five is the head of the right humerus. Obviously, you can tell from this one, this is the right humerus, right? What about one? Uh, one, I couldn't see it uh, very Here good. You go. Do you have a question mark in there? I don't know one. Maybe just a second. It's a neck. It's one of the necks. You yeah. have two necks in here. So which yeah. which neck is this one? So you have the anatomical neck of the right. Uh, okay. Yeah. And ten yeah. would be the surgical neck. It would be the surgical neck. Excellent. Um, yeah, that's fine. Let's check the answers. You have anatomical. Uh, guys, just forget the numbers. I, I think my numbers have changed when I change the view. Um, so forget about the numbers for now. So we, we had the anatomical neck, which is number five, and we have the greater tuberosity, which is a muscle attached, like we said, supraspinatus, and this was number three, if you remember that. Uh, and you have the head of humerus, that was number five, okay, and the bicepital groove, that was number six, and you have uh, the longer of biceps, and you can even add the latissimus dorsi muscle. And also you have the lesser tuberosity, we have the subscapularis, and you have the surgical neck of humerus as well. All right. Okay, Nazir, do you want to identify number two? Uh, two, it will be the uh, capitulum of the uh, right, uh, right humerus. Yeah. What about number uh, 13, I believe? 13 will be the trochlea of the right humerus. Okay, what about, let me just to add someone trying to get in. Okay, so what about number five? Uh, five, it will be the medial condyle of the right humerus. Think again. Uh, sorry, 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 the, the lateral condyle. Of lateral the, condyle, and seven? Seven will be the medial condyle of the right humerus. Okay. The way I remember it from medical school is capital radio, right? Capital radio. Uh, so you're thinking about capital and, and the radius, right? Yeah. Uh, so 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 that five will be the lateral, and seven will be the medial. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, I think the numbers here are correct. So you have the capital of right humerus. Again, be very specific in your answer. You have the lateral epicondyl five and the medial epicondyl, uh, maybe ten. That was the olecranon fossa. And you have the trochlea of the right humerus number 30. Okay. Well, in this one, we need you to identify all the markings. What about four? Uh, four, I, I always <laughs> confuse between the olecranon and the coronoid, but I think. The okay. Four... So, so the olecranon is always, is going to be. Four? Posterior. Yeah. yeah, it's four. So obviously this is posterior part of, we said, we said that this one is olecranon fossa, right? Yeah. Um, so, so the olecranon will articulate in here, okay? And you have a coronoid process will articulate in this fossa, okay? You can call it coronoid fossa. It's not really called coronoid, but uh, I think it's called trochlear fossa instead. But you can call it coronoid fossa because it articulates in here. Only in, in when you're flexing your elbow, right? Does it make sense? So olecranon yeah. is posterior. So this is olecranon. What about one? One it will be the uh, coronoid. Coronoid process. What about five? Five it will be the trochlear notch of the. Excellent. What about two? Uh, the radial head of the right. Uh, okay. Three. Three will be the uh, surgical neck. Okay. Six and seven. Uh, six will be the radial tuberosity. Seven the under tuberosity. Sounds good. Well done. So let's start. Uh, we said the coronal process and head of the right radius. Yeah, I think, yeah, you answered all of them uh, correctly. Okay, so identify number two in the next image. What is that? Number two, it will be the uh, spiral groove. No, it's a, I mean, this is sort of, it's called the Lester tubercle. I'm not really sure about its significance, to be honest, but it's called the Lester tubercle. 
and it's uh, at the distal end of obviously the radius. So you have this is the radius, that's the style of process of it, and that's the end of the radius. It's called Lester tubercle. I'm not really sure if it gives attachment to anything significant, but it's one of those things that you need to study. Okay. Well, can you tell me the structures that are present in the spiral groove? Yeah, there are two structures. Uh, number one, the radial nerve. Number two, the posterior circumflex humeral vessels. Okay, so it's called profunda brachii artery and radial nerve. But yeah, well done. Um, the supracondylar fracture of the humerus, there are some associated or possible injuries that can happen with the supracondylar fracture. Can you tell me some of those? Uh, the, the ulnar nerve injury. It's very less likely to happen in the ulnar nerve, but yeah. We can consider it, but it's it's it, it can happen, but it's very less likely in comparison to other things that I need to mention first. And uh, maybe also so, supracondylar radial radial yeah, arm. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, sm a small trick. So literally, it's all the structures that's coming from the arm down to the forearm, and our important structures are a risk of injury. So most importantly, the vascular injury is what we worry about the most, right? So you have brachial artery might be injured. You have radial nerve, media nerve, ulnar nerve, all of them can be injured. But the one that you need to mention first is really the brachial artery, okay? Uh, but basically all of them can be injured. But but in, in that sequence, brachial artery, media nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve, all right? All right. So brachial, median, ulnar, and radial, radial ulnar. Okay. Um, identify from one to eight on this one. And obviously, we're not following these numbers. We're following the other numbers, these numbers. Uh, I will try because I, I think it will be difficult for me for this to memorize this at the hands of. It's, it's all right. I'm going to I'm going to help you. Yeah. Let's start by one. Uh, one, it will be the scaphoid. No, so, so scaphoid will be proximal. Proximal, right? And um, the de so, so we start by proximal. The scaphoid looks like this one. Okay, this is the scaphoid number three. It's proximal and lateral. All right. What else? Which number? Uh, uh, we're back to one. We didn't answer one yet. Uh, one. It will be the tra uh, trapezoid. Yes, the tra trapezoid. What about two? <laughs> Uh, so it will be the tubercle of uh, trapezium. Trapezium. Excellent. So trapezium, trapezoid. What about four? Uh, four. It will be the capitate. Okay. What about uh, seven? You're doing really well. What about seven? Uh, seven. The PC four. No. So so so. So it's like a song. I always know it like this from medical school. Trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. All right. So yeah. this is the hamate, the hook of the hamate. Okay? okay. The trapezoid is a sesamoid bone. It will be very small and over another bone. So which one do you think will be the trapezoid in here? The, sorry, the pesiform. Uh, pesiform, it will be... Uh... It's a sesamoid bone and it's very, very small and over the, another bone. Will be seven. Seven, yeah. So that is pesiform. What about six? Uh, six. It will be triquitrium. Tri yeah, triquitrium, tri triquitrium, and five will be lunate. Lunate. So scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, pesiform, uh, and and then trapezium, trapezoid, and capitate and hamate. All right. Okay. So um, your last question, and then we're gonna move on to another candidate. It's been like twenty minutes now. So um, can you tell me about the scaphoid blood supply? Yeah, the uh, the scaphoid has a blood supply from the lateral and distal branches of the radial artery uh, through uh, the palmar and dorsal branches. So this will provide uh, abundant blood supply to the middle and the distal bone, but it will neglect the proximal, which is mainly depend on the retrograde flow of the blood. Okay, so yes, you have here palmar dorsal branch I mean, like I said, you just keep your answer very short. It has blood supply from the palmar and dorsal branches of the radial artery, and the blood supply is from distal to proximal. You were not asked about the risk of a vascular necrosis. You can save yourself a question, and if he wants you to answer that question, he will start asking you. All right? 
So Palmer and dorsal branches bridge the artery and blood supply runs from distal to proximal. Okay. okay, so can we get someone else to participate? Who's next? Who's next, guys? Thank you, Nazir, very much. Who's next? Uh, uh, yes, yes, doctor, I'm here, Saad. Okay, Saad, um, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, sounds really good. Can you identify two in this one? Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Two is uh, uh, spine of the scapula, uh, spine. It is the lateral end. It is uh, acromia. It's two acromia. Yeah. You seem to be saying it right, but like we said earlier, to try to make your answer very specific. Okay. Yes. yes. So, so, so that, is, that would be the acromion, but which, what acromion, which is capillary like this, which is. Okay, you know, okay, like, okay. Uh, try to specify. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, left, left side, acromion of the left side. Okay, fine. What about five? Uh, five is the infrascapular fossa of is the it, left. Is it infrascapular or infra something else? It's uh, infraspinous fossa. Uh, infraspinatus fossa, right? What yes, about yes. 11? Where is 11? Uh, subscapular uh, sub uh, fossa. Okay, what about 15? Uh, suppress uh, spinous fossa. Okay. What about three? Uh, three is the coracoid process. Okay. What are the muscles attached to number three? Uh, 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 muscles are uh, PCB, that is pectoralis minor, uh, coracobrachialis, and uh, uh, short head of the biceps. Okay. Well done. That is really good. So we said the acromion, uh, and again, you'll be specific. The coracoid process, the infraspinous fossa, the scapular spine is number five. I mean, these numbers, guys, again, these numbers are not accurate. I need to uh, change them, but the numbers is what we say, basically. <coughs> the subscapular fossa and the supraspinous fossa. Attachment is the three things, coracobrachialis, pec minor, and shorter biceps. Okay, I didn't find nine of five in this one. What is nine? Uh, nine is the uh, supraglen uh, supraglenoid uh, supraglenoid uh, process of the uh, which side is this? I think the right right. No, scapula. it would be the left again. It would be the left again. Okay, right? left. Okay, left. Uh, supraglenoid area of the left scapula. Okay. It's called supraglenoid tubercle. What are the muscles tubercle, attached yes. to it? Uh, supraglenoid tubercle, uh, long head of uh, biceps, long head of biceps. Okay. What about five? Uh, infraglenoid tubercle. Muscle attached the, to it. Uh, long head of triceps. I hope I'm not uh, getting it the other yeah. way around. Yeah, that's fine. Obviously, what is yeah. three? Three is the glenoid cavity. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you got it yes. right. You got both of, both of them right. Um, uh, the supraglenoid is biceps and infraglenoid is triceps. Okay. Let's go to this one. Can you identify one, two, three, four, five? Uh, yes. Uh, one is the. <clears throat> one is this the clavicle, uh, uh, right clavicle. One is the uh, acromial end of the right clavicle. Two is the uh, conoid tubercle. Three is the shaft. Four is the uh, sternal end. Uh, yes. Okay. So I think there uh, are a few things need to be mutilated in here. So one, 
is the acromial end of the left clavicle. Okay, the left clavicle, and, yes. And, and, uh, and two, the conoid process, something called conoid process. Three, is the shaft of the left clavicle, which has a groove in here, the subclavius groove. And four is impression of costoclavicular clavicular ligament. And five is the sternal end. Five. So how can you yes. identify, how can you identify right or left? It's quite tricky for the for the clavicle. So the acromial end is flat, as you can see here, and the sternal yes. end is round. The sternal end has a tubercle in there, which is an impression for the ligament. And also it's it's a, the medial two third is concave anterior and the lateral uh, third is con, uh, cave posterior, all right? So, sorry, convex anterior and convex posterior. So the medial two third is convex anterior and convex posterior in the lateral third, all right? Great, so this is how to identify the side and then this, the structures in here, we said one is flat, that's a chromial end, five is round, that's uh, uh, the uh, uh, sternal end, three is a groove or the shaft, two is conoid process, five is an impression for a ligament. Okay. How to, to find the coracoid process by surface anatomy? Mm, coracoid process, I think um, around uh, two, two and a half centimeter uh, 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 distal or inferior to the mid shaft of the clavicle. Uh, you can palpate around its structure. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. So usually it is between the lateral quadrant and medial three quadrants of the clavicle. All right. Yes. It's, yeah, it's sort of similar to what you said, but that's that's from the text that I read it. Just medial, th medial and lateral, um, uh, one three quadrant and one quadrant. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Mahmoud, I'm you you're doing really well, by the way. I'm gonna give you a choice. Which one would you like to cover from this? Uh, which, uh, um, upper limb muscles, I think. Okay, let's go with that. Can you tell me about the muscles that flex the elbow? Uh, flex the elbow, it is uh, biceps brachii, uh, brachioridialis, uh, coracobrachialis, uh, brachialis. So, yeah, coracobrachialis, uh, biceps brachii, and brachialis as well. All right. Uh, there is the flexor deuterum superficialis and flexor deuterum pro profundus. Tell me about their insertion, please. Uh, flexor distorum uh, superficialis is inserted uh, with the help of two slips at the base of the uh, middle phalanx and the dis uh, flexor distorum profundus is attached to the base of the distal phalanx uh, through a single slip and function uh, we need to do flexion at the uh, proximal interphalangeal joint to check the function of the FDS and FDP, we have to isolate and check the flexion at the uh, distal interphalangeal joint. Okay, well done. So I, I think, yeah, you answered it very correct. I think the main thing is, is to make sure that your examiner is getting your answer. So start by, well, so now I'm going to talk about the FDS. Then the FDS is usually inserted by splitting its tendon and the base of the middle phalanx. And during examination, I would like to do this, right? And the FDP, yes. it's inserted, pass it through the splitted tendon and the inserted the distal phalanx. And during the examination, I will do this. So I think it, saying the answer like this will sort of make it easy to the examiner to understand and get what you're saying. All right. Okay. Which tendon? You remember the pesiform? We talked about the pesiform. What? Which one is the pesiform, Muhammad? Uh, uh. Uh, number seven. And what is the muscle attached to it? Uh, flexor carpi ulnaris. So FCU, yes, that is correct. I'd like you to identify from one to ten. To be honest, to be honest, this you don't have to identify from one to ten because this diagram is quite stupid. To be honest, but um, let me 
ask you instead. What is number one? This one. Uh, uh, this is the extensor compartment. So number one could be uh, extensor digitorum. Uh, number two can be extensor indices. And uh, number okay. three, number three is, uh, I don't know, I think uh, extensor carpi ulnaris. No, number three uh, is, uh, hold on, hold on. Number three, I'm pointing okay. to it. This is okay, okay. One. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I got confused. Uh, intertendinous atta oh, inter attachment. Yes, yeah, connections. connections, all right. Uh, what about number four, which is this one? I'll point to it because uh, the diagram is confusing. Yes, yes. Uh, first dorsal introsia. First dorsal uh -huh. introsia, all right. Uh, yes. Let me point to five to you. So you look five is pointing to this, but actually they are, they wanted to point to the style of process of the uh -huh. of the radius. Uh, radius, right? And then the yeah. other side, the style of process of the ulna. But I mean, yeah. let's just skip five and six. Not really important. Uh, what about number eight? Uh, number eight is uh, uh, ab uh, ab uh, abductor digiti minimum. Yes, uh, abductor, abductor digit minimum. Okay, can you tell me number nine and ten? Uh, number nine and ten, extensor carpi radialis longus. Number nine and Which number ten, is extensor carpi. Uh, nine is yeah, longus and ten is extensor carpi radialis brevis. I I think I think I'll need to make sure to be honest, but I think it's the other way around. So let me go through them. So you have we said extensor digitorum, that's right, and you said extensor and these that's right. You said number three correctly, and four correctly. Five and six we said it. Seven, where is seven? We didn't find seven. So yeah, this is seven. That's extensor carpi alnaris, seven. Eight is abductor digiti minimi. So um, nine, yeah, you're right. Nine is longus. Nine is longus and 10 is brevis. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, I confused it. But yeah, well done. Um, okay, that's an, another silly question. Can you tell me the functions of the intertendinous connections which is basically number three. What are its functions? Uh, uh, functions are uh, coordination in extension, uh, maintaining tension. Uh, those are the two I remember. I think there are three or four. Yeah, Don't exactly so remember. remember. It creates, creates coordination, space yes. And yes. coordination of extension and uh, redistribute the force as well. And stabilize the joint. All right. So, so these are the main things that you need to mention. We talked about the rotator cuff muscles and we mentioned them. Can you tell me the attachments and their nerve supply? Uh, rotator cuff muscles are uh, sets that is supraspinatus, infraspinatus, tennis minor, and subscapularis. So, the supraspinatus muscle arises from the supraspinous process to the upper part of the greater tubercle. My, my uh, in, mind what you say, sorry, I'm about to interrupt you, but uh, it's supraspinous fossa, no process. Yes, yes, fossa. yes. So, uh, All right. supraspinous so fossa focus to the upper part. I know you know, yes. you know it, I'm sure you know it, but, yes, but yes. just focus what you're saying, All right? Yes, yes. Uh, supraspinous fossa to the upper part of the greater tubercle. Uh, uh, infraspinatus okay. is, is infraspinous process to the lesser tubercle. Uh, there is infraspinous fossa. Yes, yeah. infraspinous fossa. Yes, uh, this minor is uh, 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 superior part, superior uh, medial, sorry, superior, superior uh, lateral uh, margin of the scapula. So yeah, it's the, the upper two third of the lateral yes. border of the scapula. The upper two third of the yeah, lateral yes, border of the scapula. Okay. And the uh, uh, lower uh, lower part of the uh, lower part of the greater tubercle. 
Uh, so, and the subscapular is the subscapular uh, fossa on the scapula to the lesser tubercle. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, nerve yeah. supply, teres minor is uh, axillary nerve. Uh, supra and infraspinous, uh, supra and is uh, uh, suprascapular nerve and uh, subscapular, uh, subscapularis is upper and lower. Subscapular nerves. I so let's go through them again. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, these are the suprascapular nerve. All right. Yes. Subscapular, no. this is which which nerve again? Can you say? Upper and lower. Uh, Subsca subscapular nerves. Uh, is it pectoral or subscapular? No, it's not pectoral. Mm, I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay, I'll have I, to reach it. Yeah, me too, to be honest. T is minor, uh, which nerve? Uh, axillary nerve. Axillary nerve, okay. So yes. I'm sorry, I didn't write the answer in here. Uh, I'll probably need to look into that and write it, okay? Well, Muhammad, so you had, I mean, we can give you like really four more minutes. So I'll give you a question from the spaces. Let's talk about the cubital fossa boundaries. Okay. Uh, so the cubital fossa uh, is a triangular. Uh, uh, lateral boundary is, uh, uh, lateral boundary is the medial border of the brachioradialis. Medial boundary is the lateral border of the Pronata teres and the base is uh, the intercondylar uh, line connecting the both the condyles. Contents is uh, <clears throat> uh, from medial to lateral is medial nerve, uh, biceps tendon, and brachial artery. Okay. Yeah, like I said, boundaries, pronata teres, brachial radialis, and line between the two of the condyles, and they have the brachialis in its floor, contains medial nerve radial artery, biceps tendon, and you can mention radial nerve at the end, all right? Yes. Okay. Flexor retinaculum, what are the attachments of the flexor retinaculum? Uh, flexor retinaculum is attached to the uh, scaphoid, the tubercle of the scaphoid and uh, uh, pisiform proximally and ridge of the trapezium and hook of hamate distally. And contents contents are uh, median nerve, uh, four tendons of flexor distorum superficialis, four tendons of flexor distorum profundus, uh, flexor pollicis longus, and some books mention flexor carpi radialis also. Yeah. So the FCR usually is because I mean you know the the fle the the flex the retinaculum itself will go slightly 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 smooth 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 and then split at the end into two yes. areas the fcr pass in between the split but that's fine you can mention that okay well your last question will be anatomical snuff box what are the boundaries of the anatomical snuff box uh laterally it is bounded by two two tendons that is extensor pollicis brevis abductor pollicis longus and medially extensor pollicis longus okay so you mentioned an anterolateral and posteromedia in a sort of lateral yes. and medial. So yes. uh, pollicis previs and AB doctor pollicis longus is anterolateral and the extensor pollicis longus is posteromedial. All right. Okay. okay. On the upper limb nerve injuries. Can you tell me what will happen if the radial nerve was injured while it's in the spiral groove? Uh, okay, uh, there will be a uh, drop uh, and uh, loss of sensation uh, over the uh, dorsum of the uh, lateral tuster of the, of the hand. Okay, so again, you classify it into motor and sensory. Motor paralysis of the rest extensor, that's rest drop. Paralysis of the finger extensor, that's finger drop, all right? And then the sensory would be loss of sensation of the first dorsal web space of the hand. This is as simple as this, all right? Okay. Can you identify? So obviously this is the hand, that's the thumb, and this is the little finger. Can you identify number 16? Uh, 
then is the radial artery. You said an artery? Radial nerve. Okay. What about 25? Uh, this is the ulnar nerve. Okay. Well, yes, that is correct. So 16 is, is radial nerve and 25 is is on the nerve. So give it give it some time to think about it, Muhammad. Uh, uh, Muhammad yeah, start by just, you know, give yourself a pose first and then answer. Because if you answered radial artery, no, radial nerve, you're going to confuse your examiner. Just take a minute to think and then answer after that. All right. So again, median nerve, sensory and motor distribution. Uh, median nerve uh, sensory uh, distribution uh, mainly uh, in the palm of the hand, uh, the median uh, two thirds of the palm of the hand, and the, um, the lateral two thirds of the palm of the hand, and the lateral three and a half finger sensory supply. And the motor supply uh, mainly the hand, uh, the muscles of the inner group. Okay. So, Mohammed, this is a very incomplete answer. So, again, yes, you have here the palmar cutaneous branch, which you give the proximal lateral palm or the the lateral two third, like we said, and you have the palmar digital branch, which you give the distal lateral palm and the lateral three and a half fingers, and you have the motor in the forearm and in the hand. So, in the forearm, it will give all the flexors, all the flexors in the forearm except two muscles, which are flexor cauli annaris and the flexor digitorum uh, pr profundus, the medial part or the ulnar part. And in the hand, it will give the loaf muscles, the lateral two umbilicals, the opponent's pollicis, and the, um, the loaf muscles are the most important, the abductor pollicis previs and the flexor pollicis previs. And they give the thinner muscles in addition to, yeah, we said a lot of term because of that, All right? So this is how you classify the uh, media nav. So sensory and motor. And again, let me just go a little bit back to adjust that. So you have here sensory and motor. And in the sensory, you have palmar cutaneous branch and palmar digital branch, All right? And the motor, you have forearm and hand, and then you start uh, classifying it, okay? Great. So you're going to tell me the ulnar nerve, sensory and motor. And again, try to make it in this classification, right? What is the ulnar nerve, sensory and motor supply? Sensory supply, uh, sensory, uh, the lateral, the medial one third of the palm of the hand and the uh, medial one and a half finger, sensory supply. And the uh, motor supply, mainly the hypothenar muscle in the hand and uh, in the forearm, uh, the flexor cardi and large and the medial part of the flexor digital number one. Yes, yes, that is correct. So you have sensory, you have palmar cutaneous branch that gives the proximal med medial third of the palm, dorsal branch, the medial dorsum of the hand and superficial branch, distal medium palm and medial one and a half fingers. And also motor, you have forearm, like you said, FCU and flexors to improve on this on part. And we have all the intrinsic muscles, the hypothenar muscles, the medial to umbilicals, all enter OCI, adductor pollicis and deep part of flexor pollicis previs. So to be honest, you just said hypothenar muscles. That's not enough. These are not the most important muscles. The most important here is the medial to umbilicals. And the inter OCI, they are very important muscles due to the flexion and the extension of the fingers. All right. Great. You have a uh, radial nerve, motor, and sensory distribution. Um, radial nerve, uh, sensory supply, mainly the, lat uh, the lateral two step of the dorsum uh, of the hand, and the uh, lateral three and a half uh, finger. The motor supply mainly uh, supply the 
Door uh, adalah lambarikan. And in the forearm, it may supply the. It doesn't give any lumbarical at all. So the motor nerve supply, sorry to interrupt you, but the motor nerve supply, it's all the extensor of elbow, wrist, and finger. And can you identify number 12? Is a median nerve. What about number four? Decal artery. What about number two? So two is anterior interosseous nerve. Okay, that's fine. But the others, you said it correctly. And this one, can you say what is number the all the area that is marked by red? What is number twenty-seven, for example? Is a uh, uh, radial artery. What about thirty? I don't know exactly. Yeah. What about thirty-one? Uh, this is the ulnar artery. What about twenty-nine? The superficial barnacle arch. Okay, so 30 is the palmar branch of radial artery, superficial palmar branch of radial artery. Okay, uh, and here 31 is the ulnar artery, and 29 is the palmar arch or the superficial palmar branch of the ulnar artery. Okay, so how is the superficial palmar arch formed? Uh, formed by the superficial branch. Uh the radial artery and the ulnar artery. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, so it's basically, it lies in the superficial in the hand of the palmar neurosis, uh, lies superficial to the flexor tendons. So when you look here, all the flexor tendons are right there, and this is the arch. It's because if we do have a superficial palmar arch, so we'll have a deep palmar arch as well. Okay, so superficial, is superficial to the tendons, the flexor tendons. It's formed by the ulnar, mainly by the ulnar artery as a continuation that join the superficial radial uh, uh, palmar branch of radial artery as well. And the branches, it gives palmar digital branches. If you look here, you will have loads of branches coming to the fingers from this arch. So it's called palmar digital branches. Last question for you, how to test the ulnar artery? Test. How to do that test? By pressing over the. Uh, That's fine. Of the so, so, yeah, so analyst says elevate the hand and ask the patient to make a fist for 30 seconds and then apply pressure on both ulnar and radial artery to occlude both of them. While it's still elevated, ask the patient to open their hand. It should be plunged or completely white. And then release your pressure. It should come back to normal in just seven seconds. If it's delayed more than seven seconds, that means it is abnormal. All right. So this is Alan's test. And this is a very important test that you need to do before doing any sort of uh, ABG, arterial blood gas in the upper limb. Okay. All right, guys, so so we had on the group that around four people said they're going to come to participate and only two of them joined. So I think it's it's a, it's fair enough to go back to Nazir if he would like to. We can give you like yes, maybe. Yeah, so we can give you maybe. Yeah, 20 more minutes, 15 more minutes and that's it. OK. To be in the upper limb, I still need to write it. I still have some more questions, so I wouldn't go through these questions today. So we'll just go back to the nerves and tell me about the median nerve injury at the elbow and the hand as well. Yeah, uh, we, uh, 
the, the I said it before, the median nerve injury, it will lead to uh, herbis paralysis. Don't say it this way, man. So herbis paralysis it's is different in C5 and 6. It might be similar to it, but they are completely different, to be honest. So median nerve injury, the way I think about it, I will go back and look at the distribution, OK? And we'll answer in the same way. I'll say there'll be sensory loss and motor loss. The sensory loss is the lateral two and a half, uh, the lateral th three and a half fingers, and the lateral uh, uh, two thirds of the palmar surface of the hand. Okay, so that is in terms of sensory. Motor, just literally talk about everything. So you talked about in the forearm, all uh, the muscles will be exactly. Except the two muscles. The yes, flexor. what will happen? What would be the complication of that? If all the muscles are paralyzed, there will be sort of ulnar deviation of the rest. And what else? A little bit of extension because all the flexors are paralyzed. So a little bit of extension and ulnar deviation of the rest because the flexor corpi and nervous is working, still working. In the hand, you have all the low for paralyzed. So it will lead to paralysis of the lumbaricals. So what will happen when the lateral two lumbaricals are paralyzed? So basically the flexion of those two fingers will be uh, uh, affected as well, right? The yes. opponent's pulses, loss of thumb opponents, and the flattening of the thinner eminence, they will be very flat. Uh, so it will have also sign of pen addiction when you ask your patient to flex their hand and try to extend it again. There'll be sort of complications. Just Google this one, sign of benediction and median nerve. So let's read median nerve injury at the elbow. You have at the elbow, sensory and motor. We see the sensory, very clear. The motor, the arm will be slightly supinated, weak crest deflection, slightly ulnar deviation, sign of benediction, like I mentioned, an ape hand deformity, and loss of opponents and loss of, loss of pencil grip. So look, look, the way I tried to explain it to you, I pretty much covered one, two, three, four, and uh, five out of seven. OK, so 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 this is the way you, you should probably explain it. What about at the hand? Obviously, the elbow will be spurred. So at the hand, you will have sensory and motor as well. It's same thing in sensory, motor, ape hand deformity, and opposition and abduction of the thumb are not possible and also loss of pencil grip. So three out of the seven things. OK, okay. All right. N next question for you. So this is your scheme to answer it. Next question is ulnar nerve injury at the wrist. Uh, the ulnar nerve injury at uh, the wrist it will be the same. Like, uh, it will be a, <clears throat> uh, there will be a motor and sensory. Uh, it will lead to a complete claw hand. So uh, motor, it will lead to a clawing of the fourth and fifth digits, uh, digits, uh, and the loss of sensation, sensory loss of sensation of the medial one of third of the palmar aspect of the hand and the medial one and a half fingers. Okay, so your motor is is hypothenar and partial claw hand. It's not complete claw hand. The complete claw hand happened with with the the clumps paralysis. All right. But with, because I mean that the root is completely destructed. But with this one, it's still partial glow hand. Sorry, guys, I just got to the very close. The ulnar paradox, do you know what, what do you know about ulnar paradox? Uh, yes, ulnar paradox, uh, it's, uh, it's okay in the proximal ulnar nerve injury. So will uh, there will be a paralysis of the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus. So, uh, and it will affect the interphalangeal joints flexion. Okay. Yeah, so so there, again, th this this one needs a little bit of clear explanation. So you, you seem to be understanding the basic of it, but um, so you need to, 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 it's a paradox. So it's less glowing when the ulnar nerve is injured at the elbow uh, in comparison with injury at the red. And the main reason why is the flexor corpi nervous and the medial part of flexor to profundus will be uh, spared in the rest injury. OK, so that means they are working and these muscles lead to even more flexion of the interphalangeal joint. OK, so mm -hmm. this is what will cause more flexion 
or more long. Okay, what is the role of radial nerve and power grip? Uh, the radial nerve in the power grip, uh, it, it, it increases the state of uh, tension. So uh, it acts as a synergetic activity in the contraction of the and flexion of the hand. Okay. So yeah, it's a, yeah, basically it supplies all the extensors, which is some technical advantage to power grip like synergetic activity. The last question, this question, to be honest, I'm not really convinced with that, but um, we're just going to go through it. So why hand grip is more powerful in extension? Because in extension position, the muscles, uh, the flexors will be in a state of tension, which will make the contraction a little bit more powerful. All right. So guys, um, just 